So why does gender even matter? Um, Nikki mentioned the Victorian Women's Trust, and I often look to the words of Mary Crooks, um, who talks about, for those of you who wear glasses and may remember what it's like before you realised you had a, a deficit in vision, we're really asking people to intentionally put those gender lens glasses on and look not just at women, but at men, at diverse gender identity and at the whole spectrum of needs that we need to service. Women are slightly more than half the population. And we know that through the Deloitte Access Economics report on gender norms that Australia is losing $128 billion per annum, potentially, by holding on to rigid gender norms and not really looking at life through a gender lens and enabling that full contribution to be realised. So a gender lens is the key to seeing and addressing the negative aspects of these norms and ensuring equity and inclusion of women. To explain how this is possible um, through the lens and through philanthropic partnerships, I'm going to invite Alex Williamson to take us through the research. Now, I'm guessing that you've all read the full bios of everyone here and you're excited and that's why you've come to hear them. So I'm not gonna say much about um, Alex other than we first met, mm, do you reckon 15 years ago? Uh, across the room at Swinburne University when we were both doing our masters in philanthropy and social investment. And Alex has remained a good friend and um, true to effective philanthropy really that whole time. So knowing the intelligence and care and rigor that Alex brings to everything she does, we were delighted that you were working on this. So Alex, <coughs> could I ask you to invite, to, to warmly welcome Alex to the stage. It's lovely to see some familiar faces in the room, but also to have such a wonderful turnout for the launch of the framework that we are so very, very proud to bring to you. So my name's Alex Williamson. Um, I'll be taking you briefly through the research project that we did um, as a preliminary to the panel discussion about its contents and some broad ranging um, other topics that will follow. So the project was undertaken last year in 2023 and it was funded by the Paul Ramsey Foundation. I know we have a few Ramsey um, folk in the room and thank you indeed for that funding. Um, it was much appreciated and it has enabled a valuable piece of research to be completed. So what was the research about? So we explored philanthropic partnerships that applied a gender lens. And the context in which we explored them was the provision of long-term housing. And we struggled a bit at the beginning, but we ended up with a definition of a philanthropic partnership that involved the elements of a formalised, but not necessarily legal form, a joint working arrangement. We said that it had to involve at least two organisations and at least one of which um, was a philanthropic funder. They had to remain autonomous, so we weren't talking mergers, but they had to engage in ongoing coordinated action to achieve outcomes that could not be achieved on their own. So keep that in your mind, that's the definition of, of what we used as a partnership for the purposes of the project. So why partnerships? Why were we interested in looking at partnerships? Um, there are some obvious points that yes, it's you can go further together. Um, it was about sharing fields of knowledge and experience, bringing different expertise together. Avoiding waste and duplication, I think that's a really important one, and Nikki again touched on that. Um, I think enabling the scale of resources to match the scale of the problem. And given the context that was chosen of long-term housing, that was particularly relevant here because the capital need for a housing project is just so significant that there are very, very few funders who can contemplate doing something like this on their own. And we also noted that the partnerships um, endure and can multiply benefits well beyond the actual individual project um, that they may have been established to support. So we wanted evidence that could inform the development of a framework. And the evidence that we drew was um, looking at this, this idea of, of a collaboration and how a gender lens was applied, not just by a single person, by a single organisation, by an institution, how it all came together. And it was inevitably going to be messy. 
you know, this is this is messy work of partnerships. But we were focused on the collaboration between these organisations. So we weren't really looking at internal factors within organisations. We left that to the organisations themselves, but what we were focusing on was how they collaborate, how it works. And of course, the intersectionality, we acknowledged of gender with other lenses. So in this particular project, those were environmental factors, they were disability, they were age, um, they were mental health, um, but there are of course many others. So we wanted a broad range of perspectives. We looked at two case partnerships, one was in Victoria and the other was in Western Australia. Each included at minimum two philanthropic funders as it worked out. We conducted a total of 15 interviews. They each went for approximately one hour. They were with CEOs, they were with board members, they were with program managers, they were with the people who delivered services frontline in nonprofit organisations. And I, we asked them kind of, yeah, okay, what worked and what didn't, because these were successful partnerships that we talked to, um, people who we talked to. But we also really wanted to understand why it worked. What were the things that enabled it to succeed? And sometimes parts of them didn't work, and why did they not work? So it wasn't just sort of the, the sequence of events, but it was the, the underlying motivations that we were seeking. And very importantly, we did secure ethics through um, review through the University of Melbourne. So we produced two resources. There's a framework and there's a case studies report. And both of these provide um, insights about how a gender lens specifically can be established or created in a partnership, what's brought to a partnership, how do you do that nitty gritty work of keeping a gender lens present in that partnership, in the work that you're doing, and how can you replicate it? How can you take it on into your future work? And so the purposes of the framework um, one of the documents is to look at what is going to be applicable outside the context of housing. So if you're working in the arts, if you're working in environment, if you're working in health, how can you still apply gender lens in partnerships? So these two resources, we hope that they will facilitate discussion and further collaboration from a wide range of starting points. They're pretty distilled knowledge. They're not hugely lengthy documents. We struggled with that, but they're not too bad. <laughs> we think they will support some better practice. What's best practice? I don't know, but better is good. And we also wanted them to warn about some of the pitfalls, the potholes, the traps, the things that people had stumbled over when they were working in partnership. So in these two documents, um, the framework uh, it includes, I suppose, four stages, that initial becoming together of, of what what's the trigger, and, and I'll return to this point later briefly. Um, we looked at working together, how that unfolds, what it looks like, what do, you, what do you do when you get to your desk in the morning if you want to collaborate. We looked at, at the delivery of outcomes that's normally in the hands of the non-profit organisations and how they actually go about um, making sure that that gender lens is um, present in everything that they do, and then evaluating for the impact of these, for this funding. Um, not only evaluating from one organisation's perspective, but evaluating from multiple organisations, and again, taking those learnings into the future work. There's some pathways forward. We've got some conversation starters in there that you can use in the tea room, around the dinner table, the person you randomly start talking to in the coffee line. We put some myth busters in there, and this was a this was something we really debated about. But we hope you enjoy them. We hope they spark some discussion. Um, and importantly, there are also some clues, some links to further resources that you can avail yourselves of. So, what did we find? What was kind of interesting? We found that an understanding of a gender lens really varies both over time but also at the level of an individual within an organisation, the organisation itself in its policies, within the partnership and within an institution or a, or a field or a community. And the second dot point here is one I really want to emphasise, which is that not everybody in a collaboration is going to bring at the start of that collaboration the same understanding of a gender lens. It's just kind of not possible. But what everybody in these partnerships does bring and, and keep, retain, is a commitment to a gender lens, and that was vitally important. 
we found that champions are really vital as well. So champions within organisations, champions in sectors, champions in parliament, champions in policy, champions in communities, the people who will stand up and put their hand up and, and, and have a voice. Um, the origins of partnerships were fascinating. Um, I've got to say that in the two case studies that we did, there, in, in each person I spoke to had a different origin story for the part, that partnership. So they all had a different narrative of how the partnership had evolved. And none of them were wrong, but they were, it was just multifaceted. They all had a different trigger point. They'd come to their awareness in a different way and at a different time. And the motivations and drivers were varied as well. So what was unexpected for us was the diversity of the funders and the supporters of these two case studies. So we went into this looking, I suppose, in the first instance, because we could find this information about the philanthropic trusts and foundations who had supported and funded these two projects. And yes, they were there, but we also had some, you know, cases where there was a funded funding from the union, there was a funding from community service clubs, there were funding from corporates who'd given pro bono time. And things, you know, there, were, there was funding from people who'd walked past a project on the street and thought, that looks fascinating. I wonder how I could contribute. So to think that a partnership is just about the philanthropy and the giving of these institutions was, was a real underestimation, I think, on, on, on my part um, at the outset. And I, I quickly learned that I was wrong. There was pushback against the term partnership. People didn't like it. It was too formal, it was too rigid, it implied legal things that they weren't comfortable with. So the wording was more collaboration or alliance or network or group or <laughs> social ties or, or any of these terms. But um, the word partnership itself was, was kind of, there was, a bit of, there was a bit of aversion to that. And this last phrase is a direct quote from one of the interviewees and I loved it. It was, they were talked about the goals of people in these partnerships, bringing a gender lens to the same thing, but nevertheless, we had a kaleidoscope, a picture that was made up of many, many different little parts that came together to make one picture, but you could turn, and a little turn created a new picture. I thought that was fascinating, and I really liked that image. Obviously, there's more work to be done. We'd like to continue and extend this research um, for different groups of funders, different types of funders, different cause areas and issue areas. I would also really like to look at the in inverted commas failures. So those partnerships that got set up and, and didn't work. Why didn't they work? What were the, what, what round it? And I think there's also in the philanthropic sector, there's this idea that you've seen one foundation, you've seen one foundation. You know, we really value individuality in terms of founders, in terms of their motivations, what they wanted. And I think partnerships, as Nikki said, um, are really great ways of bringing that together. Very quick thanks to Launch Housing and My Home, our two case partnership organisations, to our interviewees who are thoughtful, candid, and sometimes quite startlingly frank <laughs> in some of their answers. Um, the Ramsey Foundation, of course, for their commitment to Australians investing in women who really do amazing things, to the Melbourne Social Equity Institute at the University of Melbourne who welcomed me very warmly as a researcher, and to all of those colleagues in the philanthropic sector out there now in the room and not um, who build and negotiate these partnerships and alliances. It's not always easy work, and a lot of people do it very, very well and every day, so thank you for that. Last slide, Julie. This is what we want you to do. We have evidence, we've done some research, we've got these two reports, but we also need change in culture and in our beliefs and our institutions to bring about change. We want people to actively seek out and build partnerships, I don't like that word, collaborations and alliances that use a gender lens. And we have a fabulous framework, it's right here. I'm really proud of this, isn't it gorgeous? <laughs> So put a copy of this framework. There are some hard copies. Um, Ella down the back is waving. There are there for those of you who like to read things on the coffee table, put it on your coffee table. If you want to read it, put it in your bag. If you're a person who likes digital, what a beautiful background it would make for your home screen. <laughs> 
it's now my pleasure to hand back to Julie to introduce the panel. Um, and I'm really looking forward to what they have to say. Thanks, Julie.